the name of the sermon is A Passion Worth Sharing. Do you have a passion that's actually worth sharing? What's the name of the title this morning? Good, we're listening. Uh, we've got the first 10 seconds. Uh, If Christ isn't our passion, we're not going to want to share him with everybody around us. Yesterday, the news reported that Kenji Goto, a Japanese journalist, had been murdered uh, by ISIS, and there was a video of his head being cut off. And I felt miserable, of course, and, and was praying with a kind of a dropping sensation in my heart, Lord, I pray he's a Christian. I know Japan's less than 1% Christian, but Lord, I pray that maybe even he became a Christian surrounded by his captors. And then not, not two minutes later, the newscaster, the news said uh, Kenji Goto, who became a Christian in 1997, and uh, I, I literally felt a surge of joy in a fierce, a fierce joy Yes, and I, and I was overwhelmed by tears because right in the middle of this black darkness was the Lord's servant, and the Lord took him home. Now, Kenji Goto was 47, so he became a Christian later on in his life, and uh, he was a, a famous journalist, and he was there going to rescue a buddy. Now, his buddy has an interesting story. His buddy lost his business, lost his wife, tried to commit suicide by cutting off his privates, changed his name to a female kind of name, and thought that he may be the reincarnation of a Chinese princess. Well, he became buddies with this Kenji Goto guy, was trying to get his life together, and he got captured by Islamic militants. Kenji Goto felt a burden for his friend, and he went over there, and this is part of the story a lot of you don't know unless you've been doing research. He was able to win his friend free from captivity, and they both went back to Japan. Well, his friend, unfortunately, went back to Syria. He was captured again. Kenji Goto thought this might be trouble. So he left a video message apologizing to the people of Japan I'm sorry if something happens to me to lay this burden on you. This is my responsibility. I know what I'm doing. And he went to try to rescue his friend one more time. Well, the friend's head got cut off, and this time he didn't make it out. His friend, he got his head cut off too. He said, I believe, in a written, he said, I believe uh, the Lord protects me, always protects me. But I know the Bible also tells us not to put to test the Lord thy God. And everybody said his work, his ministry, his compassion was because of his faith in Christ. Well, Psalm 116, 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Or maybe your translation said the death of his saints. Well, that's, that's kind of a scary thing because if you're a Christian, you're a saint, and we're always praying, God, spare my life. And God's putting in the Bible, precious in my sight is the death of my people. Well, I trust the Lord. Sometimes I'm a little bit uncomfortable with trusting him to do his will because his will doesn't always coincide with Dan Wolf's will. I was praying for Matt Silvius to be healed miraculously. I was hopeful that he would be healed in such an amazing fashion that... The doctors, everyone around him would be shaken and say, this is truly of the Lord. Uh, I wanted God to get glory by his healing. Many of you know uh, that one of my best friend's dads is struggling with cancer. And I thank you for your prayers, those of you who remember to pray. Dad's been spending some time with him this week, and he got to share the gospel and pray with him. Uh, he went through the Romans Road together with him, and then Dad asked him the old D. James Kennedy, Pastor D. James Kennedy question from Evangelism Explosion, which was a very famous book on evangelism that I studied when I was at Moody. 
And the question goes like this, because it kind of sorts people out where they're standing, what they're trusting in. If you were to die today, and you went before holy God, and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? Do you know what most people say? Well, I, I'm just hoping that you'll let me in. I hope I've been good enough. I hope my good outweighs my bad. And the cross tells us that nobody's good is good enough. If we could be good enough to go to heaven, Jesus would not have died on the cross. So dad prayed with, with uh, my friend's dad, and, and uh, he said, you know what, I'm just trusting in God's grace. These are things we're celebrating more than a touchdown even on Super Bowl Sunday when somebody gives their heart to Jesus Christ. We've had a lot of cause to celebrate in our church over the years and even within the last year, thanking God for the things he's done in people's lives. I've used that same question many times myself to get past people's natural legalism. People are naturally legalistic. We think of legalistic means always judging. Well, that's part of legalism. The other part of legalism is thinking, if I obey the rules, if I have more pluses than minuses, I'm going to be good to go, which of course is a misunderstanding of law, isn't it? I've never gotten a speeding ticket. Is, is it okay for pastors to do something superstitious? Never gotten, I, I'm not superstitious, by the way. That was a joke. Uh, I want to be clear. Uh, I'm not superstitious, thank my lucky stars. No. Uh, there, I've never gotten a speeding ticket. But I've also never had a police officer pull over and say, how old are you? Well, 40, how old am I anyways? 46 or 7, somewhere around there, yeah. I never had a, a policeman say, well, you've never gotten a speeding ticket all the time. Here's 500 bucks. The law does not work that way. The law, we're supposed to meet the law. When we fail to meet the law, that's when we're punished. You don't get rewarded for being obedience. That's what is expected. God has his holy, perfect law. We all fall short. You don't get rewarded for when you follow the law. When you fall short of the law, that's when punishment comes. So there's no such thing as being good enough. God's law is perfect. Heaven is open, wide open, and you can go there two different ways. Everybody always thinks there's one way to heaven. No, there's two ways to heaven. Now, Christ said there's one way to heaven, and that's him. So I'm trusting him. There is another way to heaven. That's absolute moral perfection, never having said... Well, you know, you can argue about the being born in sin nature and all that, but let's focus right now. Has anybody ever been absolutely sinless in their life? Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, so if, if you don't fit into the category of never having ever said, thought, or done anything wicked or selfish, mean-spirited in your entire life, then you might want to think about option number two, put your faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and mine. Jesus loves you. He's offering you forgiveness. He's offering you eternal salvation. Put your faith in him. Come to him. And why wouldn't you? If, if you're pretty sure you're not going to follow the category of sinless per perfection. Uh, going back to, to Matt's funeral, really, I mean, the, the parking lot was packed. There was maybe not an empty place in the entire parking lot. The church was packed, standing room only at a large church here in Janesville, uh, uh, New Life. Uh, and uh, the pastor who spoke was a pastor of River Hills, and he did a great job and was uh, thinking they're cheering him on, praying that his message be heard by people, knowing that not everybody there has squared away where they stand with the Lord. And if they don't, if they haven't done that yet, they really need to do that. And the pastor was laying out the gospel, and I was I was cheering on the inside and praying that his words would be heard, and I was very proud of him and proud of my family in Christ. I, all these people, I don't even know their names, but who have put their faith in Jesus and are, and are moving the kingdom forward. But I was most proud, well, I was very proud of, of uh, uh, the boys from our church, Jerry and John, who got up there and read scripture and did a fantastic job. And I was most proud of, though, was uh, Matt's two sons. Uh, yeah. Uh, Matthew and Nicholas. I was wondering if Nick was named after Gizardo. Yeah. So, but uh, anyways, uh, these two guys got up there, both of them teenagers. And I had seen one of them wrote something on, on Facebook, and I was really impressed with that. Their papa 
was lifting weights and some broke loose and broke up, blocked the blood to his brain and he he died suddenly. The pastor said that morning he and Matt were together talking about the things of God, sharing, uh, I don't know if it was a cup of coffee or breakfast together, but having a good time together that evening, lifting weights, trying to look out for his health, and, and he was finished. And these two sons not only spoke lovingly of their dad, and I was very moved, trying to figure out how I could get my kids to say those things without me being dead yet, you know. Uh, and, uh, and totally, totally thankful for uh, the way they were concerned about the lost and concerned about Christians living their lives fully for the Lord. I thought, we might get a pastor or two out of those guys. I also thought, I always liked Matthew. Looking at his sons, it wasn't the size of the funeral that made me think he's a great man. You can be very popular and not be great in God's eyes. Looking at what he did for his sons made me think this was a great man. In a verse that the pastor uh, from River Hills quoted, and I've already read to you. Uh, no, I didn't already read to you, but I'm going to read to you. And that both of the sons mentioned and others mentioned was from Philippians 1.21. For, for to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. And uh, most of my life I focused on on that second part, and you think about it in the context of funerals, dying is gain. Dying is gain. Uh, the person that has put their faith in the Lord, when they die, we don't weep for them. We weep for ourselves because we're going to miss them. We know that they are more alive than ever, that Christ has wiped their tears from their eyes, that they're in the presence of the living God, and we rejoice for them even as we say, you know what? I may still be here another 10, 20, 30, 40 years, maybe more if you're little. I'm going to miss this person, and I hate this separation. I hate death. It's a nasty thing, and I'm glad the Lord did something about it on the cross. But <clears throat> Nick, one of his two sons, brought out something that I had been thinking about all week, and it really impacted me in the context of all the death we've had in and around our church just in the last few months. And... Uh, and I was going to preach on this, and then he went and did it first. He put the emphasis not on dying is gain. He put the emphasis on living is Christ. If you're still sucking air, you might as well live your life for Jesus Christ. I don't know where I picked up this phrase, but I picked it up just a few weeks ago, and I've been using it a lot, building kingdoms of dirt. might have been at the... I think it might have been at the Pastors and Wives Conference I was at. Don't waste our lives building kingdoms of dirt. And uh, there's kingdoms of dirt, there's the kingdom of God. Let me define this. Everything that's not the kingdom of God is a kingdom of dirt. So what are we living our lives for daily? What are you living for? Because when you die, if it's not having to do with the kingdom of God, it's not going to matter. Now, I prayed a prayer because I'm always impacted and hit by the weakness of my words. You can talk up here till you're blue in the face, but what we need is the Holy Spirit. And what we need is the Holy Spirit to impact my thinking and my way of doing things and your thinking and your way of doing things. And I want to urge you, brothers and sisters, I don't care how old you are. If you're in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s. 70s, I don't care. If we are not living our life to build the kingdom of God, I want to implore you, brothers and sisters, to change. And it's not immature. It's, we think it's a sign of maturity. Well, I, I already knew that. or I'm already, No, it, it's actually a sign of maturity to repent and say, you know what? I need to refocus my priorities. That's a sign of maturity. You know what? Maybe I need to do things differently from here on out. That's a sign of gaining wisdom, uh, being teachable. Brothers and sisters, we need our passion to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And this needs to be a passion worth sharing with everybody we can. Uh, <coughs> I've been uh, corrected by my church many times over the years. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the things I'm 
always so worried about uh, something being mistaken, mistaken for, for, for bragging that I usually, I, many times I've been able to pray with people, lead them to Christ during the week. I don't even mention it to you guys on Sunday. I think that's, even as I say that's not a good thing, I'm thinking I'll probably still do that a lot. Uh, brothers and sisters, I, I, I've been told I need to share these stories because it brings joy and excitement to the church. I want to share uh, just real quickly, and I'm going to talk about this actually next week, I think. Uh, we have, uh, what's your name again? Adam. Adam, who's one of my best friends that comes to my house twice a week. I see him like four times, five times a week. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember my own children's names. So, yeah. My parents can't do that. Yeah. Your children's names are Yes. Uh, Adam uh, came to faith last week, uh, last year which was a, a wonderful thing. Uh, I was thinking about that this week, and we talked about this on a Thursday night uh, because Toriano was there. Uh, when we were living in Milton, our townhouse was here. Then the townhouse next to us was a couple, and then the townhouse next to that one or next to that one was a couple, and then there was another couple over here, and then Adam and, and Jessica were going there to visit and, and play games and play volleyball and everything. And, uh, while we were living in Milton, we were sharing our faith, obviously, all the time. We got to lead our neighbors to Christ. And they were coming to church here until they moved to Delavan. Now they're going to church in Delavan. We got to lead our neighbors next to them, which was Lindsay and Nick at that time. Uh, we got to lead them to Christ. And uh, Jessica started coming to, to Japanese class and she was the only person in class who wanted to learn Japanese with Yumi, and Yumi did a great job with that. By the way, this is not, I got to pray with a lot of these folks, but it was Yumi who was the nice one. Nobody looks at me and says, let's be friends with that family. <laughs> everybody looks at Yumi, and everybody wants to be friends with Yumi, and that's because they're smart, because everybody loves my wife. And, uh, but I, but then I got to pray with the folks, and, and so Jessica started coming, and she was involved in a lot of different stuff, uh, not walking with the Lord. But, uh, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I didn't know if I was in trouble or what, you know. Thank you, brother. And, uh, well, you know, Jessica became a Christian, uh, threw away magic books and burnt some stuff and gave her heart to the Lord. And Adam, uh, I should have asked permission for, I have permission, right? Yeah. Uh, Adam was... Uh, uh, honestly resentful. That wasn't the deal he signed up for. Uh, he didn't want his wife spending time at church, didn't want her going to church. And Adam is a smart guy. I liked him before he was a Christian. I like him even more now. But Adam was a smart guy. He, he's good at mocking. Uh, intellectual guy. And he uh, looked down at Christianity, fair to say, right? Yeah. Well, after years of not wanting Jessica in church, this guy gave his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ last year. Yeah, right? And uh, listen, I really think I'm a miserable sharer of the gospel. I don't think of myself as evangelist at all, but I really have a hard-headed determination. I don't want to waste my life. So neighbors over here and neighbors over there, this family became four different families just living around us. Uh, in, in Milton, we were bringing the gal behind us to church until she moved away, uh, I mean in Janesville. Uh, in Yumi and I, wherever we've gone, we've been able to reach out to people. A lot of this is just plain old determination. I said in Sunday school class, I've probably prayed with over 100 people uh, to become Christians. Uh, D. James Kennedy said, if every Christian just led two people to Christ, the world would be one to Christ in a generation and a half or something like that. Trust, it was a long time ago I read that book. But it was just, if every Christian just was able to lead a couple people to Christ, the whole world would be saved to, well... I, uh, I don't think I have the gift of evangelism. What I do is I keep sharing Jesus everywhere I go. And we're going to talk about this more next week, but for the first part of my life, I shared the gospel. I was really had a burden for lo the lost even in grade school. I was inviting all my friends to church, v VBS. Always thought we've got to get people saved. I didn't even like church or Sunday school or VBS. I loved God but I was bored by it. 
it wasn't until high school that I got thrilled with the church and I would be tearing up every Sunday morning at Grace thinking, this is where real life is happening. This is, this is where the people of God are missing. We, we need people here. But, but I knew that it was true before that, even though I, my heart wasn't captured by it completely at that time. And uh, I have honestly shared the gospel, not just one-on-one, -on -one, but with, in large groups with, with several hundred thousand people. What that means is most people have told me no. And most people I've said, I'd like to pray with you to accept the Lord, have told me no. Well, is my pride or is it okay for me to re get rejected if there are dozens and dozens of people I believe who are going to the kingdom of heaven there because I kept sowing seeds even though people tell me no? Brothers and sisters, uh, I, I'm emotionally fragile. I don't like people to reject me. I don't like people to tell me no. I'm, I, I don't like people to think I'm not cool, which is a losing proposition for me because people don't. Uh, but, but I keep talking about Jesus, and there's no great secret to winning people to Christ. I keep talking to people about Jesus, and I get to pray with people because of one simple fact. I've been doing it since I was a little kid, and I haven't stopped. Keep sharing the gospel. If you think you're inadequate, join the club. Don't let inadequacy stop you. I care about people's souls. I believe heaven's a real place, and I want to live my life as if I believe heaven and hell are real. And that's why I talk to the people who cut my hair about Jesus. I'm talking to people in line at the shopping. I've talked to people in line at the post office about Jesus. I, and when I get an opportunity, I'm talking about Jesus. To my, the waitresses, to the people that clean my room at hotels. I'm always looking for an opportunity to share Jesus. To, to die is gain. But I don't know how much more time the Lord has given me. And I want to use it for Christ. Brothers and sisters, I know you're all doing great things for the Lord, and I know we're all different, but we all want to be teachable and able to grow. However you've been doing it, is there space to be more bold? Is there space to, be, to sh scatter more seeds? Here's the challenge. What does this mean for me to live as Christ to die as gain? What does that mean to you? More of a challenge. And again, this is not meant to be accusation. This is meant to be exhortation. This is meant to be encouragement. I am a, a nasty, hard-headed, selfish, self-righteous sinner uh, that is so messed up I deserve hell, but for the grace of Jesus Christ. How many people have you invited to church in your life? Dozens, hundreds, thousands? How many people have you shared your faith with in the last year, just in the general sense of scattering seeds? Maybe just send them a card. Maybe just uh, put it on Facebook about your testimony. Uh, again, that could be thousands, hundreds or thousands on Facebook. How many people have you shared the gospel with in the sense of actually calling people to give their lives in obedience to Christ in the sense that, guys, let's pray together. You, you, you know you need Jesus, right? Let's just pray and get this done. Let's just, let's just get this done. Uh, I want to accomplish a couple things today, and uh, we're, I'm not going to go fast. We're going to go slow today. Explain why we should share the gospel. We've already been doing that, and then some practical things to help us do that. And we're just going to do this a little today. We're going to do more next week. We'll see, maybe three weeks. First off, brothers and sisters, please listen. When we talk about sharing the gospel, we need to be very clear ourselves. We understand that what that is. And today, you may be here this morning and say, you know, I thought I was a Christian. I've been going to church. And I thought being a Christian meant going to church. Well, going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger, right? Just going to church does not make you a Christian. And it might click in your mind suddenly this morning, wow, I've been going through these religious things, but I never really understood the gospel. I don't think I've given my life to God yet. I, haven't, I don't know if I've said thank you for the cross yet. I don't know if I've said, God, forgive my sins. I want to live for you. I want to be your person. And, and brothers and sisters, if that's you today, just get it done. 
uh, no reason not to. You in your heart, you know that you fall short of God's goodness, right? We know we're all messed up. It's easy to turn on the news and to look, open your newspaper and look at the, I was going to say look at the radio, but maybe listen to the radio would be better. It's easy to know the world's messed up, right? Everybody knows the world's messed up. Liberals are angry at conservatives. Conservatives are angry at liberals. We're people angry with Muslims. Muslims are angry with other people. Uh, you know, Europeans and, and Americans and, and black and white. The world is, everybody's angry at somebody, and it's easy to see the world's messed up. Brothers and sisters, just do a little bit of introspection. Can't you see you're profoundly broken on the inside? We're messed up. The grudges, the bitterness, the lust, the greed, the, the anger, the, the critical nature in our hearts. We are messed up. So what's the case then? You need a savior. So why I'm saying this? If you haven't done this before, get it done today. Just get it done. Put your faith in Jesus Christ today. The gospel is not sharing traditional values. I am a conservative. I like traditional values. I am absolutely confident that the United States and the world would be better with more traditional values. But I'm not weaning people traditional values. I trust that the Holy Spirit can lead people to, to grow in their faith and to become humble to the teaching of God. But that's not the gospel. And, and also, as a missionary, do you know, I was not calling people in Japan, I was over there for eight and a half years, to become Americans. My job was not to say, well, you need to become an American. If you want to be a, a Christian, you need to become... No, I was not uh, selling America. In fact, uh, many of you know I was able to pray with a man from Iran to lead him to Christ. For the first couple months that I knew him, all he wanted to do was bash America. And uh, what I constantly did was resist my temptation to defend the greatest country on earth, which I believe... I'm a historian. I love history. You look at history, I don't think there's been a nation like the United States with so much freedom that's done so much good around the world. I resisted the urge to defend my country. And what I would do is I'd look him in the face and say, listen, you can complain about that. Other countries are going to complain about your country. But you need to deal with your sin because you're messed up on the inside. You need Jesus. You need a Savior. I would not talk about my country. I'd talk about his need for God. We aren't simply hoping people will clean up their lives. I want people to clean up their lives. I want people to, to just live and have good marriages and stop running around and, and I hate abortion and all these. I want people to live for godly lives. But I'm not pushing moralism. I'm not telling people, you need to act the way I act. And we aren't selling this myth of, follow Jesus, you'll be happy. You'll be like a puppy or maybe a bunny. Uh, follow Jesus, you're always going to be healthy. Follow Jesus, you're going to have a lot of money. Did you know that in countries, uh, sociologists, non-Christian sociologists have studied this. As countries become more uh, biblically based, as they, if more and more people give their heart to Jesus Christ, guess what? The economy, the standard of living, the health goes up. So I, I do believe that following Christ has huge blessings. People stop wasting their money on prostitutes, stop wasting their money on alcohol, start going home after work, trying to build up their family. There are blessings. Following the Lord results in goodness. Uh, but we're not here to sell happy, fluffy, life is easy, come to Jesus. Follow Jesus. He'll give you a pretty wife. If you already got a wife, he'll give you a prettier wife. Actually, that part is true. You follow Jesus and pray about it, your life, wife will be more lovely in your eyes, I absolutely promise you. Uh, but, you know, bigger car, bigger house, bigger wife. Uh, follow Jesus. I stole that one from my uncle, and I'm never going to let it go. It's too good. Jesus will, will bless you with a nicer, all what this, fill in the blank. It is true that God blesses. Absolutely God blesses. That is not the gospel. That is not the gospel. Fluffy, happy, follow Jesus is not the gospel. Here are four things, if you're taking notes, that must be a part of your gospel presentation. If you want to share the gospel, you need to bring in the bad news. You're thinking, well, the gospel is good news. That's right, gospel means good news. To understand the good news, you need to understand the bad news. 
The good news is there's a parachute. The bad news is the airplane's going down. There are four things you need to bring to, to give a part of your gospel presentation. This is the gospel that Christ came to initiate. This is the gospel that Peter and, and, and Paul brought. This is the gospel that the early church was founded on. And it was none of those things I was just talking about. They didn't go saying, you have to be good, you have to be good, you have to be good, quit sinning. They didn't go saying, come to Jesus, you'll be happy, bouncy. They didn't say any of that. Here are four things. Number one, we are sinners. This is the bad news. And if people don't know they're sinful, they won't know that they need a Savior. No more myth about the goodness of mankind. I've studied too much history. I watch way too much news. You can't fool me. And by the way, you could talk about how good you are. I don't believe you. But I'm not believing it about myself at all. Uh, I told myself I'm not going to preach angry today. <laughs> I know myself. I'm messed up. I need a Savior. And come on, be honest, you do too. Uh, and so when I talk to people about being sinners, I lead with myself. I don't, you are a sinner. It doesn't, people are so defensive and self-righteous, it never goes well. I always lead with, you know what, <laughs> I'm really messed up. And just what I told you, the world's messed up. You know it, right? Yeah. I don't believe that there is such a thing as uh, goodness uh, or, or, or righteousness as just a human construct. You believe the world's messed up? Oh, yeah, it's messed up. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what we're talking about when we talk about sin. And you know what? I don't need to point the figures. I just need to look inside my own heart. I am so broken. I am so messed up. And, you know, probably you know that too. So you don't, you don't just point fingers at people. You talk about yourself. You let them know, I'm a sinner. I am hopeless. Isaiah 59, 2. But your sinful acts have alienated you from your God your sins have caused him to reject you and not listen to your prayers. Do you feel alone? Do you feel like God's not listening? Here's the problem. Romans 5, 8, But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We are all sinners. We're all messed up. Point one, we're sinners. Now, point two, these have come from the four spiritual laws, uh, which I've used many times to, to, to lead people to Christ. People said you have to use the four spiritual laws. I'm actually, by nature, uncomfortable with a pat formula. The reason I use the pat formula is because it works so well. And I like leading people to Jesus. Take step one, step two, step three, step four. And then, would you like to pray together? The best technique for evangelism is the one that you're doing. Not the one you'd like to theoretically use, the one that you're actively doing. So if you like to use a different method, if you learn something from the navigators or whatever, go ahead and do that. Get out there and share the gospel. Romans Road is a great one that Dad uses, and, and we've used it in our church numerous times. I, I use it as well. But uh, Four Spiritual Laws, it's a nice little booklet. You can go through it. Number two. So point one was we are. Point two, nothing we can try will make us good enough. God's standard is perfection. And that's where you usually have this uh, little diagram of two cliffs. Man is on one side. God is on the other side. And you say, our sin separates us from holy God, from heaven. And nobody is ever good enough to get to God. You could say the best priest, the best, the best uh, uh, Buddhist monk, the best person ever. And then I used to talk about Michael Jordan, great athlete. He can't jump out and he'd go, ah, and he go, ah. And listen, boom. You know, and nobody is good enough. You are not going to be good enough. All your philosophy, all your morality, all your, your worldview, all you try to do, you're not going to be perfect. You can't get there. And, and I remember I drew this for a woman in Japan, and, and her daughter was coming to church. She said, my mom hates religion. She's never going to give her life to Jesus. She's, she's strongly anti-religion. I said, you know, we don't know. We're just going to keep praying because you don't know what's going to happen in the future. And I got a chance to talk with her, and I drew this diagram on, on a napkin. It was throwaway for me. I drew it and forgot about it. Here we are. Here's God. No way we can get over. But God can bridge that with the cross. God can, if we can't jump up to him, he can reach down to us. And he's reaching down with nail-scarred hands. I drew that on a napkin. I totally forgot about it. Several weeks later, she was sitting in our 
dining room, Yumi and I were talking to her, and she's on the verge of tears. She's shaking, and she says, I want to show you something. She reaches into her purse. I, I don't know what she's doing. She starts to unfold a napkin. I'm so sharp, I still don't know what she's doing. <laughs> and she unfolds this napkin and says, you wrote this for me. Then I was overwhelmed because for me, I wrote it, forgot about it. She's been thinking about this ever since. And that woman who her daughter said, she's never going to be a Christian. She can't stand church. She can't stand religion. Uh, gave her heart to Jesus Christ and became a believer. Uh, God's standard is perfection. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you are saved through faith. And even this is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It is not of works so that no one can boast. Nobody can stand before God and say, look at me, I'm all that. Nobody is good enough to ride into heaven on a high horse. You only get to heaven on your knees saying, Lord, forgive, I'm a sinner. Nothing we can do can ever make us good enough. That's point two. Point three, we've just talked about on the cross, Jesus paid for our sin. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 4, 25, he was given over because of our transgressions. He was raised for the sake of our justification. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made the one who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. 1 Peter 3, 18, because Christ also suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, to bring you to God by being put to death in the flesh, by being made alive in the spirit. On the cross, Jesus paid for our sins. If you could get to heaven another way, Jesus would not have had to die on the cross for your sins. The reason he gave himself on the cross as a substitute, taking our punishment upon himself, is because he loves us. And there is no other way. You're never going to be good enough. Throw away the illusion that you're that good. You ain't. I'm not either. You need the cross. You need what Christ has done for you. Point four, when we trust God and accept Christ, what Christ has done for us, he saves us from our sins and gives us eternal life. It's like you're drowning in the water. And let's say you ate, you want to go swimming, and we're on the beach, and I ate three big pizzas, and you ate 20 hamburgers, and you're saying, oh, this is awesome. Let's go swimming. And you jump in, and you start to drown because you're cramping up, because you ate too much. And I ate these two massive pizzas. And I say, I'm going to save you. I ate two pizzas. Even if I'm not cramping, I'm just too heavy. I'm sinking. And so I cannot save you. And then some guy who will go unnamed, but he's got JC on his shirt, comes by in a rowboat. He says, let me save you. I'm blah, 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 blah. I think I'm doing fine. And who are you to think blah, 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 you could save me? I am honestly drowning in my sin. I need somebody who's not in my condition who is sinless. I need somebody who can reach down and pull me out. And we cannot save each other. It's like that old Bugs Bunny thing when you're in the water or you fall off a cliff and you grab your hair and you can pull yourself up. You can't, okay? That only happens on Looney Tunes. And that's Looney Tunes. We need somebody not in our situation who can save us. And that's why Christ, the sinless one, is the only one who can. Point one, we're sinners. Point two, nothing you can do can reach heaven. Nothing you can do to measure up to God's standard. Point three, on the cross, because of love, Jesus did what we can't do. He bridged that gap, bridged the divide with the cross. And now do, 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 you walk across the cross in faith. That's how you get from one side of the cliff to the other, where we go from our lost condition to a relationship with God. And that's point four, when we trust God and accept what Christ has done for us, he will save us, and he will give us eternal life. John 1, 12, But to all who have received him, to those who believe in his name, he has given the right to be children of God. Amen? Amen. John 3, 16 through 18, For this is the way to God. Uh, for this is the way God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, that everyone who believed in him, everyone who believed in him, would not perish. It means go to hell, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not condemned. The one who does not believe has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. And that's the situation when you're drowning in the water. It's not God sends you to the water to drown. You're already drowning in the water. The one who decides not to take that helping hand is condemned already. You need to grab a hold of that navel-scarred hand, and he will pull you out of the water. A Japanese woman uh, that I, I married 
uh, her and her husband many years ago. Uh, Yumi helped lead this woman to the Lord. And a couple weeks ago, she said, I'm reading my Bible with my husband, and I'd like Pastor Dan to explain the gospel. And here's what I wrote. And I'm doing this because Yumi and I have wrote this kind of letters numerous times over the years. This is just a simple way. What Ruth wrote a letter. Here's the gospel. I write, asked to write a brief letter of encouragement. Uh, here's what I said to him. Dear friend, I was asked to write you a brief letter to encourage you to place your trust in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, you can write nice kind of letters too. In fact, I've, I've heard of people who would, it was so hard to spit out the words of the gospel that they wrote their husband a letter and they said, here's the steps of the gospel. They wrote their, their neighbor's letters. They wrote their co-worker's letters because it was so hard for them to do it. They wanted to write a letter. That's okay too. Or, or write something, post on Facebook saying, I really want everybody I know to go to heaven. I've been to too many funerals recently. I need you to go to heaven. So, okay, I'm encouraging you to write a letter, okay? Uh, I, I was asked to write you a, a brief letter to encourage you to place your trust in Jesus Christ. It's been many years since I performed your wedding ceremony, but I am happy to help you in this respect if I can. Faith in Jesus begins with an understanding that we are all sinners. We have all said, thought, and done things that are against God's will. None of us are perfect. We have all hurt the people around us at different times, even sometimes those we love most. This is called sin. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's important that we recognize that on our own, we are spiritually bankrupt. None of us are as good as we should be. None of us are the people that God has called us to be. We all fall short of his perfect standards. In fact, we even fall short of our own standards. Sometimes we struggle, uh, sometimes we judge people for things that we ourselves have done. Again, this is called sin. This is a spiritual problem that people, that all people have, even pastors. I think deep down inside, all of us know we are not as good as we should be. We all struggle with selfishness. The Bible teaches that all humanity is profoundly broken. We are selfish and self-righteous. We hold on to grudges. We look down at others. We make excuses for our own sins. All of this has separated us from holy God. God does not even have a shadow of sin in him. In fact, it is because God is it is in fact it is because a God is a perfect standard of goodness that we can that we can all measure ourselves and understand that we fall short. So the first step to closeness with God is to understand our own brokenness. In order to accept a savior, we must first understand we need one. If a fireman came to my house right now to rescue me, I would not accept his offer. I'm comfortably writing you this letter at my desk. However, if my house were on fire and I knew I was in danger, I would gladly accept his offer. In the same way, each of us is separated from God because of our sin. Again, only those who know that they have said, thought, and done sinful things will know they need a Savior. This is why everyone, come to, came to, this is why everyone comes to God on their knees. We humbly ask him for forgiveness. No one comes to Jesus riding a tall horse and bragging about how good they are and how they are better than other people. We can't fool God. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are those who are spiritually needy. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. This is because God loves to forgive. The doors to heaven are not locked, but most people lock their own hearts from accepting the love and grace of God. Jesus is asking us to open up our hearts to him. Revelation 5, 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. On the cross, Jesus took responsibility for all our sins. He took our place. In order to save us from our sins, God came down in the form of a human being and took our punishment upon himself. Hundreds of years before Christ was born, this prophecy was given to, about him, Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Romans 5, 6 through 8, you see, at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 4, 25, he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Romans 4, 7 through 8, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven. Blessed, remember we said, means happy or lucky. 
Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man the sin, whose sin the Lord will never count against him. So I wrote to my friend, here is what you must do. If you know that you're a sinner and you believe that God loves you and is eager to forgive you, then I hope you will open up your heart to God and give your life to Jesus. Confess your sins to God in prayer. Thank Jesus for dying on the cross in your place. Ask God to forgive you and become the Lord and master of your life. When you have done that, I encourage you to find a nice church that will help you and teach you on how to live your life in gratitude to God. No church is perfect, but that's okay. You and I are not perfect either. Only God is perfect. The rest of us need his grace and need to give grace to one another. Here are some more Bible verses that God has given us to help us follow him every day in our lives. Romans 10, 9 through 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is in your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Romans 10, 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer up your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Romans 12, 9 through 21, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. He's talking about in the church, above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. Zeal is like passion. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, which is, again, like passion, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Another verse we used at the funeral yesterday. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eye of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, he will heap burning coals on his head. Do not become, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I hope this letter has helped you, my friend. God is good. He has never let me down. Blessings, Pastor Dan Wolf. Brothers, yeah, and pray that his heart will be ready to receive. Brothers and sisters, uh, why do we think that zeal is a bad word in America? Don't be zealous. You sound like a suicide bomber. Don't be, have too much fervor. You can be crazy about football. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, let's have passion for the things of God. Let's have zeal for the things of God. Let's be filled up with a spiritual fervor. Talk to your friends. Scatter seed wherever you go. Just like the early Christians and Jesus and Paul would go into the marketplace. Why'd they go to the marketplace? Because that's where people talked. We need to take the message of Christ to our schools, our neighborhoods, our workplaces. And where do people talk today? Social media. What would Paul say? What would Jesus say? Where do we connect? Where do we talk with people? Where, where can we go to bring Jesus? Uh, how many hits we got on the what does Fox say? A million hits? What does the Fox say? 1.6 million hits for your daughter saying, what the Fox say? It's awesome. We need to find a way to bring Jesus to everyone around us. Your coworkers better know, if they are spiritually hurting, where can they go? Do they know that you're the person they should talk to? Do they know you're sold out for Jesus Christ? One time one of my coworkers said, Dan, you really want me to become a Christian, don't you? I said, yeah, not only you, but everybody else at this place too. Yeah, everybody should know that you want them to be saved. Uh, family, coworkers, your neighbors. And again, the place where people gather today is social media. We need to use that to share the message of Jesus Christ as best we can. But you may be thinking, well, it wouldn't sound genuine if I talked about Jesus on social media or my neighbors or my coworkers. If it doesn't sound genuine, brothers and sisters, that's something to pray about. Share your passion. Share your passion. 
Talk with anybody for 20 minutes, and guess what? Their passion comes out. And I like people. I like talking to people. I'm not interested in model trains. I've had people talk to me for an hour about model trains. You know what? I get interested in it. I do, because they're passionate about it. And people have hobbies, and they're doing something, and it becomes interesting. I'm not a car guy. I love listening to guys talk about cars because their enthusiasm is contagious. What do they love? Football, movies, model airplanes. They love their grandkids, quilting, sewing. It's genuine, and their passion doesn't feel fake. If your passion is Jesus, it's never going to feel fake. Amen? It's going to be real if it's real to you. And people are going to know. Maybe they're going to say, oh, I don't like you to do that. Very likely they will say, I don't like you to do that. Uh, and maybe they, uh, uh, I've had, uh, yeah. I've had a lot of people reject me. Uh, I, I had a Mormon told me the other day, Mormon guy said, boy, I really admire the way you share your faith. I, I've never seen so many take that much abuse and rejection. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I really have not faced much. I, I do not feel persecuted. Uh, people who don't know what they're talking about look down at me sometime, and I figure, well, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, but we need, to, we need to share. Jesus uh, told us, where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. So what, what do you treasure, brothers and sisters? Because that's where your passion is going to be found, right? So I, I don't want us to be beat up. I'm exhorting. And I need to grow in these areas. I'm not what I should be. Uh, but brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter how long we've been doing something, not even decades, if we feel the Holy Spirit's convicting us, if we think maybe my priorities were a little off balance, the, the holy thing, the wise thing, the mature thing is to say, I need to share my faith more and leave the results up to God. If you share your faith with a 1,000 people and zero people come to Christ, is God upset? No, God's pleased because you loved your father enough to want to win people to him. Show your love to God. Jesus died trying to get this message out. If we keep it to ourselves, how loving is that? He did this incredible sacrifice. The weight of the world's sin was placed on him. And I'm not going to tell people because I'm a little embarrassed. Jesus loves the people that we're embarrassed to talk to. What do I treasure? Jesus treasured people, and that's why his heart was laid bare for everyone to see. Jesus treasured people. What do we, I treasure? Free time? Yeah. Certain personal persona and image? Yeah. Popularity? Yeah. Just getting along with everyone? Yeah. Don't want to rock the boat? Yeah. None of that really sounds like Jesus, does it? <laughs> Jesus and his followers, Peter, Paul, and others, loved God and people way too much to crave a comfort zone, to crave being accepted, to crave being seen as reasonable. Don't you want to be seen as reasonable? Oh, usually people who think I'm unreasonable don't seem to be that reasonable to me, but anyways. You want to be seen as a reasonable person, but our world, if you talk about your faith, people are going to think that's unreasonable. We have to decide, brothers and sisters, what do I value more, my own comfort zone or somebody else's eternal destiny? My own image or somebody else's eternal destiny? Being seen as rational and reasonable and not one of those Christians or somebody's eternal destiny? At this point, it comes down to what do I really believe? And you've heard me say this many times. I don't want us to be an offensive, angry, self-righteous church. I don't want us to be full of empty platitudes. Hallelujah, praise God, you're going to hell. And uh, The gospel offends. You're a sinner. You need to get on your knees. Let the gospel offend. The cross of Christ is offensive. But let us not be offensive. Let us be winsome and loving. And if you love somebody, they're willing to listen to you. But if they feel like you're coming down at them and you think you're so wonderful, they're not going to listen to you, and they shouldn't. The gospel, when we share the gospel, it's one beggar, remember, telling another beggar where to find a banquet. Amen? It's not us coming down. If it is, we're out of line. Our butts are not big enough to fit on the judgment seat of God. So if I want to love God and love other people and show a life of gratitude for what Christ has done on the cross, 
this is all coming back to scattering seed, isn't it? It's almost like Christ's last words were go out and tell everybody and make everybody disciples. It's almost like if you're going to be a Christian, this is, oh yeah, that is true. This is big to God. Brothers and sisters, uh, we uh, have cut our budget for, for, for marketing. Uh, I don't like that. We still spend a lot of money on marketing. I like that. Uh, but we, this was inevitable. It was just we had to do it because of our situation. Uh, let's make up for it by really grabbing a hold of all your buddies and all of our friends. Let's pack this place up. Let's say we stop spending as much money and we grow even more. Wouldn't that be cool? Uh, <clears throat> do I believe Daniel 12, 2? Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Do I really believe that? Because if I do, then I want everybody to come to eternal life. I came across an article last Wednesday, and you guys are so lucky. I cut out 2.5 pages of my attack on global warming here. <laughs> uh, I, I should cut a lot about this when I decide to make it two messages. I, anyways, cut a lot. I came across an article last Wednesday entitled, Climate Change Deniers Are Completely Insane. So I was eager to read it because I consider myself open-minded. I'm a skeptic. I think that my personality, it's my default setting, is skepticism. I'm so skeptical, I wonder how I ever became a Christian. But, but I'm glad I did. And so uh, I think people that are only halfway skeptical, I, I see this all the time. They're skeptical of the Bible. They're skeptical. And I'm wondering, when are you going to start being skeptical of your doubts? You know, Why don't you just go all the way? And full board uh, skepticism and doubt might lead you back to Christ. Uh, but this article I read, climate change deniers are completely insane. I thought it was going to argue for man-made climate change. And there's a lot of stuff. I mean, the glaciers of New Zealand are disappearing at such a rate that the ground is actually rising by an inch a year. Glaciers all over the world disappearing. There's a lot of argument for global warming. So I thought climate change deniers are completely insane. I thought I was going to read an article that's going to give me some scientific reasons why climate change is happening, and I was interested in that. Uh, turned out he was a global warming skeptic. I didn't agree with everything he wrote, but his ending caused me to think. You don't have to agree with everything, but listen to this. He wrote, even the people who believe in man-made climate change don't really believe it. That's why so few of you folks actively adjusting your lifestyle in any substantive way. I mean, if you think the Earth itself is on the verge of destruction brought upon by human beings and our technology, wouldn't you clothe yourself in a loincloth stitched from foliage and run off into the wilderness, living in a hollowed-out tree and subsisting on wild bear edibles? Uh, if you possess the conviction that the planet itself will die if humanity does not make dra dramatic changes, wouldn't you begin by making those dramatic changes yourself? But you don't. Maybe you buy a hybrid. Maybe you put a Save the Earth bumper sticker on the back of the hybrid. Maybe you turn your heat down at night, and then you, uh, when it, and when it comes down to it, left-wing environmentalists continue on living the same way we all do. They drive around, buy things, watch TV, fly on airplanes, eat at restaurants. They sermonize about the end times, but that's all it is—a sermon. At at least other religious cults put their money where their mouth is. You guys use a lot of dramatic language, but do nothing. Let's not even talk about environmentalism or global warming. That's why I took out the two and a half pages. <laughs> Change his words just a little bit. Even the people who believe in God and heaven and hell don't really believe in them. That's why so few of you folks are actively adjusting your lifestyles in any substantive way. I mean, if you think that people are dying and going into eternal damnation all around you, wouldn't you do a lot more to win them to Christ? Wouldn't your heart be stirred up to genuinely love them instead of looking down at them? Wouldn't you want to share with them the message of the cross of Christ instead of isolating yourself in a holy huddle? If you possess the conviction that they will be eternally separated from everything good if they don't make a dramatic change, wouldn't you begin by making a dramatic change yourself? But you don't. Maybe you post about church on Facebook. 
Maybe you put a Jesus Saves bumper sticker on your car. Maybe you donate some used clothes to a shelter. But when it comes down to it, so-called Bible-believing Christians continue on living the same way we all do. They drive around, buy things, watch TV, fly on airplanes, and eat at restaurants. They sermonize about the end times, but that's all it is, a sermon. At least other religious cults put their money where their mouth is. You guys use a lot of dramatic language, but do nothing. Uh, I don't think we can't drive cars and fly airplanes, by the way. Uh, but his point is, you don't really believe in global warming unless you really want to make changes for it. Difficult things are painful, if they're worth doing, though. Brothers and sisters, do we really believe hell is burning? Because I want to say that hell is burning while the church sleeps, right? The church is asleep in its pews. Uh, we need to live our lives. You only have so much minutes you can spend, and God could take me today, God could take you today. We don't know how much time we have left. Let's live our lives loving people enough to tell them about Jesus. And you have clout that God's given you. Influence. How are you going to use your influence? I've told people before, never leave a school, a business, a community without sharing with Jesus with everybody you can. Because at that point, you're not going to have any more impact on them. Use your clout, use your impact for Jesus Christ. Spend it while you can. Uh, I've been to too many funerals recently to pretend anymore. I'm not going to pretend this life goes on forever. And although I know this kind of message is upsetting, it's either our church does it right or why are we even here. Yesterday, a good friend from Trinity, a fellow pastor, African-American guy, posted on Facebook, we were at that funeral for Matt Silvius yesterday. He posted on Facebook, left my house yesterday uh, for my cousin's funeral today. I'm home now and more determined than ever to preach the good news of the gospel because of the brevity of life. Until everyone follows Jesus, I have work to do, whether I'm liked or disliked. Brothers, share your faith. Share the gospel, whether you're liked or disliked. Lots more next week. Uh, God, humble us, break us, remold us, do it us whatever you want. And Father, I pray that everybody in this room has the joy of it leading uh, at least one person to Jesus this year. Amen. Hello, my name is Pastor Dan Wolf from Foundation Bible Church. Thank you for watching Foundation Television. Uh, the reason our church does this is so we can reach out into our community and share the love of Jesus Christ. We have a good God. We have a God who loves us, a real God who really cares. And it's he's put it on our hearts to try and uh, share this message that God is there for people, that there is God who's willing to meet them where they are at and to love them and forgive them. But it's also on my heart that uh, there's parts of church that you just, uh, you just can't experience in front of a television screen or on a computer screen. Uh, Jesus wants us to come together as one family, all different kinds of people from different nationalities, different income levels, different education levels, maybe people that normally wouldn't even... Uh, hang out outside of a church setting, but we're united by Jesus and he brings us all together. But I really want to encourage you, if you're able to, to take that step, leave your comfort zone at home, uh, find a good church to go to. We have so many good churches in the area and I'm sure you're going to go there. You're going to be loved. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be encouraged. People are going to care about you. There's no reason we have to do life alone at home, but we can get out and meet with other people who are on this journey to to, to know God better and to allow him to reach into our lives and, and uh, let his grace rest upon our lives. So uh, again, I just want to encourage you. Thank you for watching. But if you can get out on a Sunday morning, boy, we would love to see you. Thank you. Hi, this is John with Foundation TV. You know, Foundation Church is a small church uh, here in Janesville. We do a lot with the size of the congregation that we have. Uh, and we've been really pleased to host Foundation TV for many years. Uh, however, due to budget constraints, we're no longer able to do that at this time. Uh, if you would like to find Foundation TV, we're still available on YouTube uh, at the address below and on local access channels 98 and in HD 994. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com.
Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.